Let me start with a statistic. If you think about all the people that you know, one out of every four has serious mental illness. And among those that do, given that uh, many of you are young people, it's important to know that three out of every four that develop mental illnesses have their onset before age 25. So given that these illnesses begin early and often last many years, it's important to get the diagnosis right. So the main point I am going to make here is that the way mental health diagnoses are made has a problem. And this problem can be addressed by rethinking or reimagining our approach to mental health diagnosis and making a diagnosis that is valid actually improves lives, maybe even saves lives. Let me illustrate this point by first thinking about how doctors generally think in medicine. Many years ago, I had just come back from abroad and I had been experiencing some symptoms of uh, chest discomfort and uh, stomach discomfort, nausea, no appetite. Being a doctor myself, I kind of thought it is just an indigestion and it'll go away. And it didn't do anything for a couple of days. The symptoms got really worse. I ended up in the emergency room. And the doctors, when they see a middle-aged man walking in with a chest discomfort, the first thing they think about is whether I was having a heart attack. And they took me to the cath lab and did an ECG, an electrocardiogram of the heart, electrical wave recording, which turned out to be normal. So then they put their spotlight on my, the rest of my body and found that I was actually growing bacteria in my blood and my liver enzymes were up. So I might have some kind of a gastrointestinal problem. They started me on antibiotics and I got better and I'm here to talk to you about this today. Now in psychiatry, doctors do it a bit differently. So I'll illustrate that point by a young woman that I took care of many years ago, sort of early in my career. Um, let's call her Mary. I asked Mary, she had come to me after being seen by many other psychiatrists. She had not accepted treatment. And I asked her, why are you here, Mary? What brings you to my clinic? She said, I have been having some attention problems, can't concentrate in my school all through my childhood. And in middle school, I began having anxiety and panic attacks. In high school, I started having some depression. In college, I began having some mood swings. And over the last couple of years, I have been having um, some thinking difficulties, some paranoia, confusion, some memory problems. So I asked her, Mary, what did the doctors tell you your diagnosis is? She said, initially they called, I have ADHD, and then they said, I have an anxiety disorder. Then they said, I have a major depressive disorder. And more recently, that they said, I have a bipolar disorder. And last year, they said, I might have schizophrenia. So she then asked the question, what do you think? Uh, can you come up with a diagnosis that I don't already know? All doctors have basically been restating my symptoms in technical terms and calling it a diagnosis. So can you prove that I have schizophrenia by a brain scan or a blood test? Can you give me a diagnosis that helps me understand the nature of my brain problem? Can you tell me, uh, give me a diagnosis that tells me that I'm on the right treatment? These are sobering questions that many other patients have asked me throughout my career. Mary is not the only one. In fact, the whole field of psychiatry is under criticism because we don't have a very good answer for these kind of questions. Why do we make a diagnosis in the first place? What you see here is the Bible of Psychiatry, which we call the DSM, or Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Um, this is a good document. Everybody uses it around the world uh, because the DSM gives us criteria to make diagnosis of almost every mental disorder. These criteria give us a kind of a useful shorthand so that we can communicate accurately between doctors about uh, describing the same individual with symptoms of the same kind in the same diagnostic terms, which is important. 
both for communication between doctors as well as for communication with insurance companies and legal people and so forth. But what the diagnostic terms in DSM does not tell us is what the underlying illness is. So while it has it is reliable and consistent, these categories are, may not be valid. They may not be telling us much about the underneath underlying disease. So let me explain to you the two, um, two terms, reliability and validity in this cartoon. On the left, what you see is this man shooting an arrow consistently to the same point on the target board, but missing the bull's eye. So it's highly reliable, but not valid. But on the other hand, on the right side, what you see are all the arrows are hitting the same spot, reliable, and also they are hitting the bull's eye, so they're valid. So the important point is that in psychiatry, we need diagnoses that are both reliable and valid. How do we move towards more validity in psychiatric diagnosis? After all, all mental disorders, one way or the other, have a relationship to something or the other in going wrong in the brain, all major mental disorders. The brain organ of the specialty of psychiatry is the brain, just like it is the heart for the cardiologists and the kidney for the nephrologists. But psychiatrists are somehow shy to look at the organ of their system, namely the brain, when they make their diagnosis. When you have a trouble with your car and you take it to a mechanic, the mechanic looks under the hood and looks at whether it's the engine is the problem or it is the cooling system and so on. This psychiatrist could do the same thing. In the last several years, there have been exciting new discoveries of different kinds of brain scans, which I have shown here in this slide, the cartoon that I drew myself. On the bottom right is the MRI scan, which gives you exquisite pictures of the structure, function, and maybe chemistry of the brain. And in the middle, what you see is the electroencephalogram, which is the way, just like the ECG of the head using electrodes in a completely safe manner, you can get electrical recordings of uh, the brain's activity and thereby look at the functioning of the brain. Now, how can we apply these kind of tests or biomarkers, as we call them, in psychiatric disorders? Let's go back to the same kind of symptoms that I presented with. If someone like me walked into the emergency room with a stomach upset and nausea and appetite, and they simply said, you have an indigestion, take these pills and go home, I would probably be dead by now. But rather than that, the doctors did an ECG, ruled out heart disease, and then uh, looked elsewhere in my body and examined my blood and the gastrointestinal system and came up with a diagnosis of a gastrointestinal infection that was causing a bacteremia, a, an increase in bacteria in the blood. That's the way medicine should proceed. But um, let's see how we might apply this to psychiatry. So may, beginning many years ago, um, a number of uh, researchers, including our own group in Boston, have been looking at uh, a large number of people with severe mental illness, psychotic disorders, and asking the question whether the different DSM categories like schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorders might differ in their biomarkers. So we um, examined this uh, population on whom we had electrophysiological data like EEG and cognitive test data. And we first asked the question whether the three diagnostic groupings, namely schizophrenia, schizoaffective, and bipolar disorders, showed any differences in terms of their biology. But the answer was a resounding no. All of these disorders looked pretty much similar in terms of their brain abnormalities. So we scratched our heads and took a different approach. Why not just ignore the symptoms and apply machine learning uh, to these biomarker data? across nearly 2,000 people, and whether we can come up with different kinds of categories that may make more sense. And indeed, 
we came up with three biological categories based on sets of biomarkers, which we call them biotypes, which had no resemblance to the DSM categories that we had uh, been all along using. Why is that important? You might remember I said our patient Mary had asked the question, can you uh, take a brain picture and tell me that I have a particular disease with a particular ab brain abnormality, and you, can you prove that I have schizophrenia using brain scans? And when you look at our own scans in these data sets, whether it is schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or schizoaffective disorder, they don't seem to look different. And a particular brain structure called the hippocampus, a tiny structure which we can now examine in exquisite detail by modern neuroimaging techniques, the hippocampus, which is important for memory, thinking, belief formation, did not differ between the symptom categories of schizophrenia or schizoaffective or bipolar disorders. But if you look at them, the same structure across the three biotypes, the differences were like day and night. Biotype one is characterized by a prominent hippocampal abnormality, which might explain her illness uh, better than anybody else's um, illness. So there might be different subtypes which are different biologically. Now our patient might ask the question, how does it make a difference for my treatment? Now, when we do categorize uh, illnesses based on their biology, we also understand what the physiological signatures or physiological alterations that lie underneath these. We have discovered that biotype one is characterized by a diminished response of nerve cells or neurons to sensory stimulation. You can call it an underactive brain. By contrast, biotype 2 is characterized by an inefficient overactivity of these neurons in response to sensory stimuli. Biotype 3, we did not find much differences from healthy people. So it's quite possible that the biotype 1 patients might respond to treatments that enhance brain activity, like brain exercises, cognitive training. Also some medicines like clozapine, which may increase, increase brain electrophysiological activity. In contrast, biotype 2, which is characterized by overreactive, inefficient brain. What you need are treatments that calm these nerves. It may be certain medicines like Valprovate, or it may be certain newer treatments, what we call neuromodulation. An example of that is transcranial magnetic stimulation, which can suppress inefficient overactivity. Biotype 3, which does not seem to show much brain changes, but still they have symptoms, it's quite possible that they may respond to smaller doses of medications. Maybe they need psychotherapy much more and a good follow-up. I'm going to end with this point that making a valid diagnosis has value. A valid diagnosis has value, first of all, it will tell you more about the underlying illness. And second of all, knowing what the underlying illness is would help the doctors to discover better treatments and also to match the existing treatments in the correct way to the correct patient. In other words, personalize the treatments to the individual patient's situation. And finally, Mental health disorders are highly stigmatized. It's a major barrier in their recovery. Stigma is because quite often they either blame themselves or the society for these illnesses. But if only we knew and if our patients know that there are certain brain circuitry alterations that can explain their illness, it is likely, very likely to reduce stigma and improve their engagement in treatment. Thank you.